All right, guys. This is, make sure you're getting clickers, make sure you're getting note cards and pencils, paper or pen. And welcome to delivering top-notch support. Hope everyone had a nice uh, lunch, has coffee or whatever they need for the afternoon. Uh, I'm Michael Lee, I'm from the Proof Group. A Little bit about myself, I've been working in the education space for really 20 plus years. Um, with FileMaker, involved in product development, design, deployment training, and uh, of course, customer support. I live in Eastern Connecticut with my family on a small farm. Ask me about that later. We have some animals. Um, and although it's freezing in the hotel, here's a picture of me from the High Point in New Jersey last winter. Um, it was nice down there. So what is support? Okay. I want to throw this out to you guys. You've got pens, pen and paper. I want you to take just a moment and I want you to think of and write down a specific example of a time where you've engaged in support. Or if that doesn't work for you, just some words. What does support mean to you? A few words. I'll give you a minute. And I'm watching. Now here's the hard part. Turn to your neighbor. Jason, you can, you can get involved in this if you'd like. And I wanna hear some chit chat, okay? Turn to your neighbor, slide over if you need to. I want you to compare notes. See what I wrote? See what they wrote? Talk about similarities, talk about differences. I'll give you a moment to do that. And don't be bashful. This is one of the best parts of uh, Claris DevCon. If you're coming in late, we're doing a little discussion, that's okay. I'm gonna bring you a plicker. Okay, guys, this is wonderful. This is absolutely wonderful. What I wanna do is sort of scratch the itch a little bit because I want you to continue some of this discussion afterwards, whether it's with me or Jason, who's also here from the Proof Group, whether you see us at lunch, walking around, we're gonna be in these blue shirts with the, with the Proof logo. No speaker shirts this year, um, probably because of the uh, branding change, right? So look for us, we'll be wearing our blue shirts if you wanna come talk about stuff that we talked about in the session or if you have ideas about what you, what you discussed amongst yourselves. I gave you a prompt pushing you in a very specific direction, but the way I define support is very broad. Support is anything we can do to help our customers do their jobs using our software, right? We don't wanna to draw too tight of a box around what support is. Support is customer service. You can't shortchange this. Now let's talk about your customers and the different roles they have at your organization. From the closest to the farthest away. So you have the end user. They're the front line. They're in there. They work with the system the most. They see the most issues. They probably are feeling the most pressure to perform, right? Next level up is the managers or the boss. This person's going in maybe less frequently maybe asking pretty hard questions, maybe doesn't really know how things work, you know, um, but they're pushing on the end user. And then of course you have the IT department and possibly even internal help desk. And these are people worried about higher level issues like security or infrastructure. 
how you support these individuals should reflect their role within the organization. And when a customer reaches out to you, they're, they're really probably not going to be in the best state of mind. Think about some of the emotions that are gonna be going through their heads, right? Doubt, panic, confusion, urgency. We've had examples in our line of work where people really think they've messed something up permanently, right? That emotional state is how they're coming to you or could be coming to you in, right? So you want to reflect calm, have sympathy, and stay out of the box. Now, out of the box is a concept that was introduced or popularized by the Arbinger Institute in the 70s with their book, Leadership and Self-Deception, which is worth a read beyond the topic of this talk, right? But it is in contrast to being in the box, right? It basically boils down to this, be a thoughtful, considerate person who values the thoughts, feelings, and opinions of others. I mean, that's, I could stop here. We could do, this could be a life coaching thing right here too. But give the benefit of the doubt and really frame your thinking that way before you engage with your customers. We feel it, we're humans, right? Somebody says something, you say, oh, they should know better. That's an in the box, that's an in the box thought, right? An out of the box thought says, you know what, the sign said push and they pulled or pushed and they pushed and it was supposed to be pull. It was labeled wrong, right? So think about that, right? Now, depending on the size of your operation, you may use some pieces of all of these. And depending on the nature of your product, whether that you have privacy concerns or uniqueness of deployments, uh, public modes of support such as forums may not be appropriate. But you have email, you have phone, you have web, you have social media. So think about the ways your customers may want to reach out to you and make sure it's available to them, okay? If you haven't already, you should consider drafting and having your customers sign a service level agreement. This simply talks about the, uh, the type of service you'll be providing, what you're servicing, how much it'll cost, how long the agreement is for, whether you're monitoring or whether they're reporting, how do they submit an issue, how quickly you respond, and maybe what your resolution time would be. That is a harder problem because it could be something very simple or it could be something quite, in, quite involved, right? So your response time should be relatively quick, I would think. People want that type of responsiveness. And the other part is to manage expectations on how long it will take you to actually resolve an issue. So bringing it all together. Now on to the task of actually doing support. Ticketing. Uh, whatever mode of entry you use, you must use a ticket for each request. Ticketing allows each request to be tracked efficiently for, from a newly created ticket all the way through to satisfaction. Each ticket should be as specific as possible. If there's multiple questions in there, split those into multiple tickets. And even for small operations, this is an imperative, okay? Don't even think about not using tickets. Tools for managing tickets. There's a good range of tools. Uh, these are just a few. Zendesk, Freshdesk, Happy Fox, Jira Service Desk. You wanna look at these and evaluate their features. Here are some of the basic features, right? Email and web ticketing, uh, transitioning a call into a ticket, social media ticketing, team collaboration, knowledge base or help center, live chat. There may be advanced features, depending on other software that you're using, automation and workflow, uh, trend analysis, performance statistics, customer feedback is very important, and of course, apps integration with other platforms. The pricing on some of these platforms is gonna range from say 15 to $100 per agent per month. Uh, there are some free tiers, but they may be restrictive. Uh, and it can be disruptive to switch once you've got yourself invested in a support platform. So this is really, you really need to do either some, some sort of testing where you are okay pulling the, pulling the cord uh, or really do your due diligence 
before you dive into this. Once you get, um, the term is lock-in, right? Once you get into this thing, uh, you're gonna, it's gonna be difficult, disruptive to the process to, sw to switch out. And then whatever system you use, develop a ticket workflow and stick with it, okay? Make sure every ticket gets resolved. Implement views uh, to keep, the, keep on top of those tickets. And the better you manage your tickets, the more useful they're going to be when you need them in the future for search and analytics. Okay, pop quiz time. You should have your clicker. I gave it away, gave mine away. Did it rotate? Ah, perfect. Jason's gonna do our, our, our grading, and what you're going to do is you're going to answer a response here by holding your clicker. There's an A, a B, a C, and a D side. You wanna put that at the top, hold it towards Jason. He'll nod when he's got you. And, perfect. And we will look at what, what what's the question? My goodness. What is most important to you? Okay, I know I'm popping this on you, right? Team collaboration, knowledge-based forums, price, or advanced features. If you've never thought about it, take a moment, think about it, hold your clicker up. Jason's gonna come across and make sure he gets everybody. Let's have him do that when you're ready. There's no right answer. Ooh, this is nice. <laughs> Yes, the letter on top. Make sure you get down here. I think we have one more. That was great. Did you vote yet? I'm going to show the results. Thank you, Jay. Don't hit the red button. Oh, see, I'm on the op. I, okay, so I did. Um, this is, I turned on mirroring or no, turned off mirroring. Maybe I needed mirroring. Here we go. Oh boy, I should turn on mirroring next chance I get. Can everybody see that? This is live data, live response, okay? Um, now I have to crane my neck a little bit. So team collaboration, knowledge-based forums, price, not, nobody's too concerned with that, advanced features. Advanced features, I'll tell you, uh, integration with billing systems, right? Uh, time tracking systems, right, like Harvest. Uh, integration with um, development issue tracking systems, right? So you can, you can take a support item and push it into development, and that's something we'll get to as well. Wonderful, hold on to that, we'll need it a couple more times. I also, we didn't have quite the audience here today, but I had a survey monkey if we didn't have enough, uh, enough clickers for everybody. So once a customer's reached out to you and told you a little bit about their issue, they need help. They love, customers love on-site help, uh, but on-site help is, is expensive from a time and a money, money perspective, and it's often hard to schedule. And it may be impossible, right, depending on your array of customers. You may be spread pretty, uh, pretty broadly. Conferencing and screen sharing tools can help. Um, products like Zoom, which has gotten a lot of negative press lately, um, make sure to upgrade. Uh, but also WebEx, GoToMeeting, TeamViewer, join me, right? There's a slew of options, right? And in the same way you're going to compare your options and your features for your support platform itself, you should look at the features uh, for your screen sharing and conferencing software from voice and video conferencing. You think some of these are just no-brainers, right? Mac and PC sharing, remote control, mobile apps, document sharing, webinars, recording sessions, and cloud storage but you probably should try those out, right, and see how they work for you, see how they might work for your potential clients. The pricing is a little bit lower than the support platforms, 10 to $50, say, per host. Uh, Zoom, I believe, does have a free tier uh, with some limits that may not actually be workable. And the last part, pretty important, it's really relatively easy to switch between these platforms, 
because you're sending those, you're usually sending those meeting links out, you know, a, a, as, you're, as you're offering help. So if you switch from one, you just send a new, a new meeting link and uninstall the web server that Zoom had. Uh, one of the goals of providing good support is to lower overall costs. And some of the ways you're gonna do that are with things like documentation. And in this case, I don't mean documentation in the traditional sense of documentation, although you may have documentation, but I mean in the sense that things are documented, okay? So that if you have a discussion, you make a note about it. This goes back to ticketing, right? Have that attached to the ticket. Parts of documentation may include screenshots, may include help videos. Documentation may include a searchable, your searchable support tickets. And then lastly, what I've written here is the virtuous product development cycle. So if, it's the ty if you have the type of software that is iterative and will improve, when a customer reports an issue, it gets fed into the development pipeline and your product gets better. And hopefully, if, you've, if a customer's asking a question, it's not their fault, ultimately sometimes it's your fault, right? And again, out of the box thinking. And if you fix that, you'll lower your support cost as well. One of the best ways to provide help is to record videos. I will often record a video in lieu of a phone call or in lieu of a, a screen share or a conference call because I get my artifact when I'm done. I get a document, I get a screen share that I can then look back on, provide to the next person who has that same question and so forth. There are plenty of free options. The two big ones are going to be QuickTime uh, screen recording on Mac and, and the Xbox Game Bar uh, which was made for gamers, but can record video on Windows 10. And I think the key command for that is WinG, and it pops up. It's, uh, it's actually pretty good. But my favorite is ScreenFlow by Telestream, which is Mac only, costs money, really pretty marginal though. Um, Google ScreenFlow Windows alternative, I can't speak to that myself, but um, it, it has a seriously powerful built-in editor. Jay, if these people need clickers, can you help them out? Um, so, but what makes a good help video, because just recording a video isn't going to be enough, okay? You want to keep it short, under five minutes for sure. Keep it to only one or a couple topics. And use editing features uh, before you post it. So with ScreenFlow, for instance, you can do call-outs where you highlight portions of the screen or do zooms. Uh, you can correct errors or re-record session, uh, particular sections. If I'm going, if I'm recording a, a ScreenFlow and I go down the wrong path and I said, oh, you know what, I meant to push that other button, I will literally just start over, take a pause, start over, and then the editing phase, just clip that section out. Uh, so remove your excess time, your ums, et cetera, and respect your customer's time. It may take longer to record these videos now uh, than just straight up recording it or straight up going into a phone call or, a, or a, a Zoom screen sharing meeting, but you will thank yourself in the future when they ask that same question, that they do that one thing one time a year, that complex task, and you've got a document, right? So what do you do once you've got your video? Uh, your support platform may include hosting, uh, but it may be kind of uh, limited anyway. Uh, it's maybe too limited to be useful. Uh, and, and videos may need to be private. You know, you may have other needs. There's, there's probably needs listed here too. I'm just gonna go into a couple options here beyond the support platforms. Of course, you have YouTube. This is the free option. Um, you have limited branding ability. Uh, and then very sort of crude privacy options uh, from completely public to private, where you actually share that with an individual Google account holder or uh, unlisted, and that they would just need a, a particular URL. Depending on the privacy needs of your business and your, your system, this might, actually, this might actually be fine. A worthy alternative to YouTube is Vimeo. The pricing on the site says seven to seventy-five dollars, depending on sort of features. But really, you're starting at twenty because the terms of service say that you must have a pro account or higher to use Vimeo for commercial purposes. Uh, but it does have player customizations, privacy controls, 
and no ads. So I would, I would definitely consider this and recommend it. An additional consideration is the different learning styles that people may come to you with. There are going to be some combination of these different learning styles. This is how they best receive information, right? Now let's talk about the big four. The first is the visual learner. This person processes information uh, by charts and graphs. They may need images to explain concepts and ideas. They're going to prefer graphical elements over words. They use charts, illustrations, and other visual aids to their benefit. And they may prefer videos and slideshows, kind of like what we have today. Next is an auditory learner. They learn best when information is spoken, perhaps lectures, maybe discussion. They process information by talking through things. Activities such as brainstorming, discussion groups, uh, the, the talking through, and we did that earlier as well. A reading writing learner may prefer to receive written words. They may enjoy reading. Uh, they process their information by writing notes. Um, these customers may prefer traditional documentation or a searchable knowledge base. We did that earlier as well. And lastly, the kinesthetic learner. They learn best through tactile processes. They prefer to create concrete personal experiences, and they process information by recreating and practicing. Right? These are the customers who are going to learn best by maybe doing and trying themselves. And if I still had my clicker, that's what we were doing. Right? We were holding up these things. Some of that's a bit contrived, right? But you want to include elements from from all types of learning styles. Pop quiz number two. Get your clicker ready. Oh, I got to get this right. See, I can't see it. Oh, man. There's only so much you can test, right, beforehand. Give me one moment, and let me confirm that I've got it going. Um, will it go here? Perfect. OK. Uh, what do you think your predominant learning style is? If you haven't thought about it, now may be a good time to do so. Realize that everyone has parts of each, right? So this is your peak, your preference, if you could have no other, right? And I'll give you a moment. We'll collect those results. will reach about 20 feet. Did everybody get it? Not quite. All set? All right, again, live data. Wonderful. There's no wrong answer, right? And if you could have voted multiple times, I'm sure we'd get a different distribution as well. So what you should do is internalize that. Think about your own learning style. Thank you, Jay. And, uh, but don't make your responses like you would want it, right? Think broadly and have lots of different elements. Oh, there you go. And then finally, the round trip, making it all worthwhile. I need to switch back. Uh, we're going to redirect product defects and feature requests into our dev tracking system. That's a whole nother talk, but you should have one of those also, right? We're going to utilize our support platforms uh, for ratings and feedback to gauge customer satisfaction. And that could be just raw performance, things like re uh, average response times, average times to resolution, that sort of thing. Do those internal audits and really do the gut check. And by doing this, you can make your product better, you can lower costs, you can make your customers happier uh, and more productive. And then we have our bonus question. Uh, let's get our let's get our scanner ready. Is it? 
I'll give you a moment to think about it. How many Clarises did you see on the, on the screens before? And if you don't know what a Claris is, think about how many pictures of things you saw that you were like, what's that? Oh, uh, yeah. And if you don't guess. <laughs> oh, man, is it that basic? Did I misspell it? No, I'm teasing. Um, I'll show you what it is when we're done. Let's see, I hope it's uh, collecting data on this. Is anybody certain they know the answer? This will be the who, uh, who wants to be a millionaire phone a friend or the totally audience. Ready, Jay? Ready to go. Let's see what we got. How many Clarises did you see? One, two, three, or four? <laughs> the correct answer is three. Uh, let me see if I can show you what a Claris is. I should have put this on, but you know the announcement was just made. Um, I'm going to back up. There's a Claris. Claris the dog cow, he says moof. He was on the print setup dialog for Mac OS before version seven or eight, seven, years and years ago. Yes. And his name sounded a whole lot like Claris, the company that Apple spun off uh, in the late 80s or maybe early 90s that then FileMaker came from. So I think this is quite a little throwback. I just put that in there before the talk. All right, bonus questions. Okay, now this actually went quite a bit faster than I thought, so uh, I do want to open it up for questions. We do have a microphone. I'm up for just you know a bit of a discussion. We have a smaller group here, so if anybody has any comments or questions, we could I could answer to the best of my ability, or we could even have a little bit of a bouncing bouncing ideas around. Um, let me know, and Jason can bring the mic around. I believe it's on now. Just raise your hand, no pressure. Did we have somebody? Oh, wonderful. So I apologize, I must have missed, I missed the very beginning, I must have missed the whole entire bit on uh, support ticket systems and all hmm. that. So I um, was wondering if you could go into more detail. <laughs> yeah, so, um, Jason, Jason works with me at Proof. Um, we are actually in charge of the support team there, so we see this on a daily basis. And one of our push-pull problems with this talk is how much detail do we go into? And so this is very high level. I think that it could be a paired session. It could be a session that's paired with a workshop to really get deep into some, some sort of use cases or case studies. Uh, but I, I, I did not get, I specifically did not get that detailed into ticketing, except to say that you should use it, right? If you don't have it, you implement it. And then you use the support platform to manage those tickets. And really, if you're, if you're just using tickets to come in and you're not doing anything beyond that, you're not utilizing what you could with those tickets, right? It's sort of the garbage in, garbage out idea, right? And there are, um, did you see the slide at all about tickets? Okay, well, it's Zendesk, um, you know, that's the one we use, Jira Service Desk, et cetera. Uh, we can talk, and I can show you on my laptop. We can, you know, we can look at that. Again, look for the blue shirts. Um, but, I mean, thank you for your question. Anybody else down here? Yeah, a friend of mine, we're just talking about support at lunch, and he said at his company, they try not to use the word ticket because <laughs> the customers don't like it. They become a cog in a wheel. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I could see how uh, some people might not like it. Um, I don't know if we use the word ticket. Internally, we do. But I think people appreciate knowing it's being tracked, right? And so, yeah, I don't think we call it a ticket to people because that could be a little scary. 
But like, for instance, if you're running a restaurant and you don't use a ticket system, you're gonna mess up orders, right? If you are trying to provide support and you're not using a ticket system, stuff's gonna fall through the cracks and you're gonna fail. So oftentimes we have to train, we have personal emails. We enter really pretty close and personal relationships with our customers and they will often email us individually and we have to train them to not do that. We have to say, look, for your own benefit, please email our support system, right? We usually say it that way, right? Uh, so we can track it. That's generally how we would say it. And people, I think, appreciate that, right? And for smaller organizations, if you've got multiple people looking at it, but not a team all together all the time, then it's the kind of thing where you could have coverage and continuation of support, right? So that people know there's a ticket sitting there and those tickets can be followed up on. So I take your point. I think people probably don't like the word ticket as much as, you know, as it, it's, it's what it's called. But So don't use it, but uh, the word. But I think definitely emphasize to people that you want this to be officially logged and tracked. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. Now, as a customer service, uh, you know, idea, we forward, our we forward emails a lot, right? We'll say, okay, well, they sent it to us, but we're just gonna forward it into support and deal with it there. And they're gonna, they're gonna understand that and appreciate it. Questions? Um, from my job, um, you know, I'm a FileMaker de developer with a, um, for a company and, you know, there's five of us and we each have a, a, a time where we, we, we're, we, we're on support. And, you know, the ticketing system I think is good but I think from a user perspective, they like the personal interaction other than sending them a file, sending them a video. This is just what I've experienced from working years on the help desk and then now supporting FileMaker. You know, I, I just think that improves um, their satisfaction with the product when you, when you have somebody who, you know, they, they can trust other than a file, a, a video. Mm, you know what I mean? Sure. So. Point taken. Thanks, Jason. So we use a ticketing system. Um, I'm curious, could you go into some depth about uh, your ticket workflow that you guys? Yes, good question. These are the sorts of things that uh, I think if I do this again, I'll, I, I hope you put in your feedback these sorts of things so that I can integrate this because these are the sorts of things that I think could be built into the talk to start with. Uh, but basically we have the unassigned queue, right? So stuff comes in, it gets put into an unassigned queue. We have an internal triage person or process that basically puts those into groups or teams and then they're assigned to the individual inside of the team. So basically a two layer sort of a dispatch slash triage process uh, that depending on the nature, well, really kind of depending on what they're doing, right? Well, what, what customer is it? Is it one of our higher ed customers? Is it one of our K-12 customers? Uh, they go into the different groups. And then within the group, there's going to be somebody who is an expert at that group's projects, and they will assign that to the individual who needs to basically handle it. And all of that's gonna happen very quickly, that part, right? Once it's assigned, we basically make the response and the response will be part of the SLA. I don't know what we have, a couple hours, the response. Uh, resolution is a little bit more wishy-washy because you really just don't know. So it's always just a guideline or a target. Uh, once it's in that, and to the gentleman who spoke about uh, you know, the file or the response, um, we're not shy to call people or set up Zoom conference calling, right? Um, and, and Zoom has, and I didn't even, I, it may have been on one of the slides, but recording sessions, right? So when you're on the Zoom, just say, do you mind if I record this? Because this is actually something pretty neat, right? And you record it, and then you can post it. It gets into the same sort of uh, workflow as uh, your other videos. Usually the purpose-made videos are going to be a little, sh they're gonna be shorter. You're gonna have better control over what's being said and the editing process of it. But if you record a Zoom meeting and then post it, um, that's a really good artifact also. You know, something to have because they say, oh, remember, we talked about it eight months ago. Now, whether or not you share that with them because it may be rambling and too long anyway, but you could go in and you could see, oh, that's, those are the things we talked about. 
and they had that problem. And then you respond back either with a phone call or through email. Now, we are traveling and we're away from our desk and we're doing lots of pro uh, different projects and we're moving from thing to thing. So it's often, we, don't, we can't take calls directly, right? Um, so we, the email or whatever the, the ticket system is, is going to be the first point of contact. But then we set up a, set up a conference call or something to, to resolve their issue after that. I hope I answered your question. Uh, I'll get to the end part. We, we, we have, uh, you know, within the ticketing systems, there are going to be um, statuses for the ticket. So the ticket comes in new. Uh, when it takes assignment, it'll become open and somebody's working on it. If you've asked a question and waiting for a response, it might become pending, right? And then eventually it becomes closed uh, or solved and then closed after the client has had a, had a moment to possibly submit uh, feedback on that, right? And at any point they reply back and it reopens it, right? So if it's pending and they reply back with an answer, it goes to open, right? So in your system, you're going to have view, unassigned, open, pending, and you'll see that and it keeps it organized. If it's an older ticket, sometimes we'll see this. Uh, it's been sitting around, they reply back to it. I think uh, at, least, um, at least Zendesk will close the ticket after a certain period of time and then if a customer replies back, it'll start a follow-up ticket that's linked to the original ticket, but it'll have its own status and its own workflow. Anyone else? Well, I would suggest uh, building the ticket system in FileMaker. <laughs> so that's called... Uh, so uh, I, I have done that, and it uh, works quite perfectly. And the reason why we did that is because all of the timing, billing, contracts, everything is connected. So, for instance, sales guy go into the yeah. CRM customer, and they, he can actually see when editing an offer or something like that, he can see that there's ongoing tickets. or. Sure. Uh, the billing department can actually extract uh, time used uh, out of the tickets, and it's very easy, actually, to do a, a ticket system in FileMaker and uh, use the FileMaker Go for the people out in the streets. Yeah. So I would suggest uh, leaving those uh, guys alone, and uh, since we're here at FileMaker Developer Conference, you should use FileMaker. Just use the ticket system, right? So if that works for you. We call it eating our own dog food, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Do you want to speak to it? Uh, I, well, it, it, essentially, what it what it boiled down to is when you're when you're working in a FileMaker development shop, and you have all of these cooks in the kitchen, everybody wants a field for something, and then within six months, we have a great ticketing system that we built together. We start it up, and then everybody starts to add their signature to it, and then what what essentially happens is is you get this large behemoth of something that. Now you have to dedicate internal resources to, and that's counterproductive, at least in our opinion. So we we actually at Proof started with Jira. Um, we had some issues with it, and then ended up settling in on Zendesk. And um, I, I've told our our CEO many times that he can pry Zendesk from my cold dead fingers, because it, it's and it's something that you don't have to manage. So yes, building your own solution is an incredible idea. Um, but we just found it to be a little bit more convenient to outsource that. Yeah, I have no, I have no real problem with it, except no. just maintaining it you know, and the cost of, of developing it internally. But if it works for you, if you've got an integrated system, that uh, you're not going to get better integration than, than the way you're doing it, for sure. Uh, but these, these do, I mean, Zendesk has external hooks and integration with other so billing systems and and the internal uh, issue tracking for our product. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I mean, we would eat our dog food if we were sort of good at it, right? <laughs> but we're not necessarily the best at building the, the support platforms. <laughs> Don't give her the mic. So you guys have a dedicated support team for smaller teams that are trying to manage a ticket system as well as a project management system as well as development. How do you recommend that they divide or split their time to be able to accommodate all of it? Hmm. Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. 
I mean, that's a lot of person, a lot of person doing stuff, or a lot of stuff that the person is doing. Um, that's a challenge, isn't it? Just on in 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 the real world. Um, the I mean, the only thing I can say is that by having these systems in place, be it a ticket tracking system for internal issues or for support tickets or for uh, project management. Uh, do you have a session later on project management? So um, those are the sorts of things that will let you not have to think about it all the time, right? So I'm here. I'm theoretically uh, present, uh, both mentally and physically. But when I want to, I can go see what's going on, right? And I don't have to remember. And so uh, they're all, they've all got mobile apps these days. But I can, within a touch of my phone, I can see what's going on back at the shop and in the queue. So even with one person. Now, I think coverage, somebody mentioned coverage. Did you mention coverage? Somebody was talking about coverage. You know, you got to have somebody for that responsiveness for the SLA, unless it's, if it's just you, that's a lot of, like, watching, right? Uh, but you can set up notifications to your phone. Um, that's what I use, even with our, so I, I didn't talk about it, but with, we use Slack for internal uh, collaboration. Um, those are the sorts of things that maybe you want to give your customer a Slack channel uh, to reach out to you, right? Uh, and then it buzzes your phone, right? And they can get right in there. That's going to depend on your SLA, right? What you're saying you're offering. This is really, if there's one nugget to take home from it, is to review or, or create your SLA, because you don't want there to be ambiguity, right? And that's going to be for your benefit and for theirs. There's another in the back. No worries. When y'all, um, just a basic setup for this, the, the ticketing system, you've got uh, a customer who's using your product. Um, and maybe you're doing customizations for them, mm -hmm. like, like a, uh, special things. Would you set up like a support, like a support side and a development side, plus like the third? Here's the main product. Mm. Is that how you would set it up and divide things out? It's messy <laughs> because of FileMaker, right? Because FileMaker lets you change things, lets you modify and customize. Well, I'm well, not saying in, I'm not saying it in in FileMaker specifically, mm, or, or actually mm. FileMaker at all. But right. for for the things that offer a a a, a like the Jira side, like if you're using sure. Jira for example, sure, sure. they've got the concept of a service desk, sure, um, which is more the customer facing thing, and then you've got the I guess it's just Jira, Jira. is the um, right. the development side. Right. Um, when you cr when you take on a new customer, do you create how granular a level do you keep track of your your clients? So I we guess? would up up until up until deployment, they're really not in support, right? They're in they're in they're in the project phase. Right. right. So we're going to manage. So this. What we're talking about is really ongoing support, right? After deployment, up until that point, I don't want to hear about it in support. That's a deployment team thing, right? Because if somebody's asking me about something that's a moving target, or the spec isn't completed, or, or whatever, or it's due, it's you know we've got it in a project management system and it's not due for eight weeks. I don't want to hear about it, right? That's not what this team is doing, mm -hmm. right? Now we wear, we're not a giant shop. We're not a small shop but we still wear multiple hats, right? But we try to keep sort of the Chinese wall between, I, I do because it's part, partly what, I, what I'm responsible for. I don't want to see open projects in support. I don't want to see it. And that's, they're using project management, right? Asana or you know, whatever you're going to talk about later. Um, but basically, that's where that stuff is, is being done. And there might be Jira, uh, Jira stories about it over there, you know, stuff for that. Um, now, what could happen is somebody asks something inside of support that becomes a project, right? And what we'll do is we'll try, you know, we're, we're, we're all trying to make people happy. We're all trying to make people productive, right, and give them what they want. So it could be as simple as creating a new report, right? That's probably not big enough to spin off into a separate project. So we just deal with it inside of support. But we understand cognitively that that's sort of a little bit different because it is kind of using this ticket to manage a, a small project, right? 
But if it's a bigger project, somebody says, well, we've got, you know, we're using it for these two offices and we want to bring in another module for the third office. That may have come in through support, but it's going to be redirected out to a separate project with a separate specification, you know, a separate budget and timeline. Because if we try to deal with things inside of support like that, it's not set up to project manage, you know, larger projects. I, I hope I answered your question. You feel free to follow up if I didn't. Okay. Thank you. You mentioned at the end, towards the end there, about a development tracking system. Yes. Uh, what are you using? How are you using it? And what does that provide for you? So we use JIRA, uh, which basically is a, it's a bug tracking system, bug and issue tracking. So it has a lot of attributes. It's not really customer facing. It's really an internal system. Uh, but it is largely similar to a ticketing system, right? Because it has tickets, um, you know, it has an internal, uh, you know, thread of conversation, uh, has, you know, the situational stuff that, uh, that, uh, that is, uh, that, that what caused the issue, what caused the bug. And then it has versions where it was reported, versions where it was resolved, right? So those things sometimes merge a little bit, right? That we have a support, uh, support ticket that's going to create or spawn a JIRA, but that the, the client responses are still through the support, the support platform. And maybe down here. Hi, um, we use Zendesk, and I do keep an eye on the um, solve time and the first response time. But what else can I be looking at to help us improve? Oh man. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, I think ours sends that out when it's done, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. When it's when we yeah, saw, when you solve, it, right? It kicks out a survey. And then they can click it. I'll tell you, the responses are they don't respond very much. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's issues with all of this stuff, right? <laughs> so it's it's about, and this goes to the documentation piece that I mentioned earlier, and artifacts in general. You want a lot of those things to be self-generating, and self-generating is is a loaded word because you're you are doing them, but Create the artifact while you're doing the thing, right? So if there is this task that you need to do, uh, the customer's asked you to do it, record it. And then at the very least, you've got it the next time you do it. It may be something you can share with them if that's something that they should or could be doing themselves. Yes? I just want to add to that uh, question. Um, we actually do uh, a telephone call the day after the issue is solved. And the reason is uh, not because I understand the automatic systems and uh, that you can click for oh, this was good and this is not good. But if you do a, a call, most often it will um, go into another assignment. Mm. Uh, you will actually find that, yes, uh, this was done, but actually I have a, a new problem. Bit more work and here. that will uh, generate uh, even more money. I like so, it. So that is our perspective of I this. Did. We call them because most often they come up with something more. That's wonderful. But <laughs> yeah, that's great. Anybody else? This is phenomenal. I mean, look at our numbers and how many people spoke. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I would hope that you know you come by and we'll continue this discussion the rest of the conference. There's some other business sessions that may get into some of the topics like this and some excellent technical sessions. So I hope you guys have a great rest of your conference. I'm not going to be updating. I did have some image updates on the slides, but it's really just uh, just, just some prettiness. Um, so no updates will be required to this. And then definitely fill in the evaluation. I know you've mentioned some things, and I want to take that to heart because I think this is pretty important. And I would like FileMaker to continue offering sessions like this uh, and to get to make them better, right? And so. I was very nervous coming into this talk this morning because I didn't really know how much to cover, at what level, right, where to stop. <laughs> uh, but your feedback will help make this better if FileMaker chooses to put something on like this next year. 
So I appreciate it. You've got, what time were we supposed to go to? So there's 10 minutes left in the session. I'm going to mill around here if you guys do want to come up off mic. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much. Submit your uh, surveys through the app. <laughs>